All right, we are here. I think what I'll do is I'll take off my um, lovely background. It seems that is causing problems just momentarily here. There we go. Okay, so welcome uh, to the February session. Uh, this evening, we are going to be talking about beef that evaluation and fabrication. And of course, when we talk beef, we bring in the one, the only Ron Russell. Uh, Ron Russell was a senior lecturer here at UW-Madison and is now uh, not newly, but somewhat newly retired and is still willing to come back and help teach young people about um, beef live evaluation as well as carcass. And, and then we're gonna just show a video about fabrication this evening. But before we begin, I'm just going to give you a few things to kind of keep in mind as we go about the evening. Make sure I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, when you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section that's at the bottom of, yeah, but it's, I'm not right okay. there. there All right. Go. I don't know why it's doing that. <laughs> um, so please put it in the Q&A section that's here on the bottom. That would be great. Um, and then I can kind of keep track and we can kind of put them through Ron Russell as we as at different parts of tonight's uh, session. The session does go till eight o'clock and we shut it down right at eight because we know kids need to get in bed and people have other things to do. So um, please go ahead and, and put that in the Q&A section. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a great evening. But this is a time where we put on our listening ears and uh, since we have two of them and, uh, you know, take the time to really settle in and listen to what our speaker has this evening. Uh, many of you are looking for um, some educational requirements or meeting educational requirements for county fairs or local fairs. So um, this education verification form is available to you. I'll put it in the chat once we get going here, um, but you can also go on go.wis.edu tnq61h and download this form. And um, it's at the bottom of the webpage and you can start writing five things you're learning about this event as Ron is talking and uh, two ways you can talk about it once you uh, get home or get to school tomorrow. I'm sure students would love to hear what you got to say, okay? Um, make sure you're staying abreast of what's going on in the youth livestock area. We've got a couple of websites you can follow. Uh, there is the Facebook page. There is the Instagram page. And many of you are very active in those two pages. And um, that's the best way to stay ahead of what's going on. Um, in, uh, Twitter is not used very often. So don't. If you're a Twitter person, you won't find us Find us there. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, that's really kind of the, the do's and don'ts for this evening. We're really glad we've got a lot of folks on. And um, what Ron and I had um, decided to do is to, to really put this through some videos and go through the videos um, from the cattle that we saw or that we had harvested. And then subsequently uh, what we ended up doing uh, for the fabrication demonstration. So I'm gonna pull up that video. And uh, Ron picked out these two cattle that we had. Um, and I'm going to share this, hopefully be able to share this little video here and, um, he can talk through what his, he was looking for. And then, um, hopefully we can get a good illustration of, um, you know, some other of the features that we'll see, um, in the, in the carcasses when we get to the carcass part. So, um, I'll hand it over to Ron. Okay. So. <laughs> Bernie's got a tough task because she says we've got to be done by eight. And, you know, I used to do power lectures, so they'd be like an hour and a half <laughs> and we'd go longer. And uh, those of you on here that know uh, me, you also uh, have maybe suffered through the idea that uh, some of the stuff we can talk quite a bit about. Mm -hmm. We can find ways to fill a lot of time. So uh, the animal you're looking at right now was a steer. Um, he weighed about 1,450 pounds. I'm trying to remember exactly what he weighed, but he weighed up in the mid-1,400 weight. Uh, he had a carcass weight of 914 pounds. 
Now, the, uh, the carcass weight of 9914 meant that he had a dressing percent, which is the amount of his the amount that his carcass weighed as compared to his live weight. He had a dressing percent up around 63%, which is honestly about what we would expect for one like him. So when I picked him out, and I picked him out at a, at a family that uh, feeds cattle, um, honestly, not that far from where I live, and they're good to work with. So I went over there because I knew they'd have a variety. So this steer I picked out, knowing that he had some weight to him, but wasn't ginormous. And I also thought that he had some muscle. And so one of the things I was watching is when he was walking around, he had some fair, he had a fair amount of width of top, a fair amount of thickness right down his top from his rib back into his loin and into his hip. And also that when you got right behind him, he was fairly square in his stance and, and fairly wide base. So I thought he had a fair de fairly decent amount of muscle. Um, let's see, I thought that he had, uh, I thought he was desirably finished as far as having the amount of fat he had on him, but I didn't think he was way over fat. And so I just kind of picked him out to be a really good representative, um, you know, steer that would be have a lot of utility in a lot of ways in the marketplace. Now, Bernie, this is a this is a video, right? So I can play it. Yes, indeed. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and let that. So when you when you're looking at a steer and trying to evaluate him, and he was kind of nervous, you got to get you got to deal with that. But, you know, right there, you can see right down between his front legs is his brisket area. He's kind of nervous. He was kind of narrow in there. He didn't have a lot of fat deposit. Now, this is a heifer that we took a video of as well. And I picked her out specifically to be kind of fat and also to be kind of narrow and light muscled. So if you look at her and her shoulder, she's kind of flat and doesn't have a lot of expression of muscle. You look at the size of her bone, she's kind of fine boned and and doesn't have a lot of, you know, a lot of thickness, a lot of bone mass. And it's not that you need necessarily a lot of bone, but we do find that muscle and bone tend to kind of go together, that heavier muscled animals, those that are more muscular, tend to have a little bit more bone. The ones that are really kind of frail or fine boned tend to not have as much muscle a lot of the time. And again, this is these two cattle's first time, obviously, being in the meat lab facility, so they're kind of nervous. They hadn't been in a facility like this, so it's understandable they'd be nervous so the video is kind of leaves a little bit to be desired but you could maybe tell when that steer was looking at us earlier that he was kind of you know kind of had some narrowness to his brisket down underneath and I don't know if you can see from this angle or not but if you look on each side of his tail head you don't see any kind of uh, protrusions or I call them pods or pones or or uh, Bernie calls them softballs they got little half softballs on either side of their tail head those are fat deposits that you'll find in heavier finished cattle. And he doesn't have those. Now, if we get a chance to look at the heifer again, and I should have previewed this a little bit better, but when we look at the heifer again, the, uh, the heifer, um, when we get over there, she will, she, you will see that she is kind of narrow and flat. And again, she just look at her. She just no width or expression of her, of her shoulder there. She does tend to be a little, little bit finer boned or frailer made. You look all the way through back to her rear legs there. It looks like she's kind of spindly boned. And that's kind of why I picked her out. I thought, well, she's going to be light boned. She's got a frail boned, light muscled. Um, and I also thought she had a fair amount of fill in her brisket area so that she'd have some fat on her. Uh, it turned out that she had a 798 pound carcass. Um, she had a live weight of, I think it was in the mid 1200 pounds, like 1240 pounds or something. The thing we got a little bit of a surprise is during the harvest process, we actually found out that she was pregnant. That was not known by the producer, by the feeding, by the feeding uh, operation that I got her from, but she actually had about a, about a five and a half, six month, uh, a long calf inside her. And uh, you'll find that once in a while when we harvest livestock and in the case of heifers and females that Maybe I, probably in, in this case, the producer didn't have any idea she was. He said, well, we never had her with a bull. Well, she apparently was with one at least once. And um, so anyway, that was kind of a surprise to all of us that she had a, uh, she had a calf inside her. That hurt her dressing percent. Her dressing percent was below 60%, which is attributed to the fact that she had one, she had a, had a calf inside her that obviously is not a part of carcass weight. But also the fact that she was kind of light muscled and and kind of frail bone, those kind of cattle usually don't have as good a dressing percent as as cattle that are more muscular and kind of fit our market needs a little bit better. 
So that's kind of a description on those two, those two cattle. All right. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. Now, so the uh, the first carcass, we're going to move ahead here and we're going to just, well, that steer just doesn't want to be in there very bad. Yeah, he was actually when when I when I was when we were loading him up, he was the one that was a little calmer. The heifer was a little nervous, but oh well. That's the way it works. Now, so this is one of the carcasses. This is, this is the first carcass. This okay, so this carcass. is the heifer. Now, you might recall that I said that she, I picked her out to have a little bit of fat on her. So if you look, um, you know, you can see where the carcass is. At, and this is the right side of the beef after after the animal had been harvested and, and, and chilled, refrigerated and chilled down. But when you look at this carcass, you can see that we take this side, and this is the right half of the carcass, that we cut, we make a cut between the 12th and 13th rib. And so cattle have 13 ribs. And we do that so that we can divide them into what's called the forequarter and the hind quarter. So all that below that cut is all the forequarter and that that's kind of at the upper part of the screen is the uh, hind quarter. Well, then when we wanna look at them and evaluate them, you'll note that I said that I, I picked her out to have a fair amount of fat. We start looking at this fat, you see the arrow we've got here, all this fat on the outside of the ribeye, she kind of followed the rules I hope she'd play by. She had a fair amount of fat on her. And in fact, the, the amount of fat on her measured, let's see, where is it on here? It measured over, it measured and adjusted to up over eight tenths. So she had almost an inch of fat on the outside of her. And again, I kind of thought she would because she, you know, even at that, even though she wasn't really, really heavy, but she was really flat and light muscled and, and showed some indication of fat from the outside. And so she had about eight tenths or a little more than eight tenths of an inch of fat. Her rib, so when we evaluate carcasses, we look at that outside fat, we look at the carcass weight, we look at this muscle right here that I'm kind of drawing, drawing around with the cursor here, that's called the ribeye. That's what you'd use to make your ribeye steaks and like, well, we measure the square inch area of that. We use a grid and you've seen grids before, I think some of you. Um, we measure that by, uh, by getting the square inch area of it. And we compare that to the carcass weight. And so she had a 12.7 inch ribeye, which isn't particularly large, especially for a carcass weight of close to 800 pounds. All right. So Bernie's kind of going across the rest of the carcass. You'll notice, you remember I said she had a fair amount of fat down in her brisket. We're going to pan down to that. That's that area you're looking at right there. All that fat hanging out there is brisket fat. And you can see that on the outside of the animal. So it is possible to look at the outside of these animals and have an idea of how fat they are, how muscular they are. Most of you have been to livestock shows. You've heard judges talk about more muscular, trimmer, fatter, and things like that. So this is, uh, this is just kind of a, you know, kind of panning over the carcass. Up in here, we get into where the, where the udder on this heifer was, and there's a fair amount of fat deposit in there. Um, that's this area right right up here in the cur that the cursor is running over right now. That would be where the udder had been on this heifer. And um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the composition on her. So we're gonna move over, I think, to the steer carcass. Uh, and again, whoops. This is gonna show a little bit more yeah. here. Of, um, <laughs> you're gonna, yeah, there we oh, go. Oh, there we go. So, so I did put the ribeye over the ribeye grid that we use to measure. And so I just threw that up there to kind of illustrate, whoops. Um, what that looks like. Um, so if anything else so, you want to add there. Yeah, right we'll just, on. so we'll, to measure that area, the square inch area of that, we will, you'll see that grid that Bernie's got on there, that, that's got dots and it. it's got squares and then center of those squares, it's got dots. So ultimately we wind up assessing how many dots we count or how many of those squares are accounted for. And each one of those counts for a 10th of an inch. So since she had a 12.7 inch ribeye, there would have been 127 squares. And, um, and that's not enough for her, for her carcass weight. At a weight of close to 800 pounds, to, to be average, she would have needed to have about a 13.3 inch ribeye. So she was about, she was a little more than a half inch short of a requirement. So that goes against this calculation of what we call a yield grade that worked against her. So she started out, already too fat because of back fat, and then she didn't have enough muscle. And so that moves her yield grade toward a less desirable direction. And uh, her internal fat, her kidney fat, which I don't know if we've got a good viewing of or not, 
but that she didn't really have that much of, so that didn't really affect it all that much, but she wound up being what we would call, and you can't see really inside the carcass there, that, that wound up being that she was what we would call a yield grade four, which is a category of yield cattle that have more fat, less muscle, and so they're not going to have they're not going to have the they're not going to have the yield of retail product we want. Too much fat, not enough muscle. Most of our retail pets are all about how much muscle they've got and and not having a lot of extra fat. Okay. So that's kind of the composition on her. Uh, number one. So this was the fatter heifer, and we showed you the grid, kind of how to measure it, and then this is another oops, an example of. Um, the measuring of the, the back fat, Ron told you, measured a, a 4.0, 4 and then we look at the, as it relates to the rest of the body, at the lower rib that he had illustrated and over the round and the chuck was still even more fat on it. So that's why we went up a tenth of a, a yield grade. And so that kind of gives you an idea on how fat of a rascal she was. And really, Ron, you know, of course, Ron's skills have not waned over his retirement, oh, he I still knows that. how to pick them. So um, that, and so we, what's really great about um, carcass evaluation as compared to live is we have rulers, we have grids, we have really data that isn't subjective anymore from, from a live judge. It's really concrete uh, information, which is it's much more black and white and, and, and easier to kind of get along and understand. Right. And then with this one, do you want to yeah. about, so, talk about marbling? Yeah. And so we also do a quality assessment on these cattle, on, on cattle all the time. One of the things that cattle are evaluated on, and certainly the carcasses that come from them, because they are going to be turned into product, is that we want to have a, a, a product that delivers a, a very desirable eating experience. And so among the things we look at is, one, we look at the maturity of the animal, because how old the animal is affects the tenderness of that animal. And, and also, then it also kind of gets calculated into what we call the, this USDA quality grade. And so if they're not a younger animal, and really it's about if they've got to be on, on the average, most of our market cattle are less than two years of age. They'll be about a year and a half or plus or minus a few months. But um, you'll have some cattle that just raise in a different production scenario that might get a little older, but they really have to be less than to be eligible for the quality grades that we mostly select for, like choice and uh, premium choice, which is like a choice average and a choice plus that move up in the choice grade, even though they're still called choice, that would that would put them in a uh, branded program, maybe like a certified Angus beef or an Aurora Angus or one of the multitude of branded programs out there. Um, and also to be eligible to be called USDA Prime, they have to be young enough. If they're too old, they're not eligible anymore. They have to get graded differently into a different category, and they bring a lot less value. And so we keep that in mind. Well, this heifer had a quality grade. I'm looking at the, what they had down. They had her as a, as a choice plus. Now, it's, it's a little unfair. So Bertie put the, put the picture, the mm -hmm. USDA photo that's a, that's a standard that USDA developed to, to, uh, to consider, to, to be able to look at, to compare. So the photograph at the top in this picture is the representation of what USDA has as a standard to make choice plus and high choice. And so it's really a comparison. So if you look at the, if you look at the top of the screen, you see the photograph, you look at the lower part, you see the actual ribeye in that heifer. And so it's kind of a comparison. Now, if you're seeing it the way I'm seeing it now, it's a little bit unfair to the carcass because when we make that evaluation, we make it on that cut surface fairly soon, like 20 or 30 minutes after we'd made that cut between the 12th and 13th rib. And so it's a nice, fresh, not dehydrated surface or whatever. The longer that muscle is exposed, it tends to dry out and whatever marbling, those flecks of fat within the muscle, the little flecks inside there, and I'll put the cursor. So up on the, up on the photograph, like that's this is marbling, even though it's kind of that's chunks kind of coarse. But these, all these little flecks, are marbling. We're looking for the amount of those or the number of those, as well as how well distributed. If we look down here at the actual carcass, that's kind of a vein of fat through there. It doesn't really count any more than anything else. But we've also got. Are um, oh, we going to get a different Make way sure to the point? Pointer comes out. There we go. Now do that. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've also, we're looking at these flecks of fat that are on there and we're just kind of 
getting an assessment of how many are there. And again, it's kind of a comparison to the photo up there. And so we're, uh, we're looking at that. Now this one's kind of dried out. We can tell that's a dried out surface. So what it had at one time is not as kind of visible as it was earlier. Now, Bernie, there's a, a raised hand or two. What do we have yeah, going on? We can look at some questions here because yeah. um, some of it might be as it relates to signing up and, and those kinds of things we're not gonna go over. Um, these are grain fed based program, I'm assuming, uh, from the cattle that Ron got, uh, they were from a grain best based. Yeah, base they were. Program. They were. They were from a, a an operation that they. It's a farm. They raise. They raise cattle. Uh, they harvest silage. They harvest grains. And yes, the, so these cattle would have been being fed a a mix of corn silage and as well as 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 corn probably and other and other grain products to be uh, to be finished. The question about why did they butcher a pregnant heifer? Well, honestly, they, 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 part of the answer to that is we didn't know she was pregnant. And if they're, if an, so in the beef industry, not all females in the dairy industry, at least historically, almost all the heifers that were born wound up in the dairy herd to see if they could become a future part of that dairy operation. In the beef industry, beef producers will only keep you know, a certain number, like 10 to 15% of their heifers back, you are maybe a, maybe a quarter of them. So if they happen to have 20 heifers that were born, they might only keep four or five to go back into their production herd. And the rest of those get sold as market heifer or as, as feeder heifers, or they might, if, if somebody retains ownership, they may just feed them out themselves. And again, in this case, the operation, the, the farm that I bought that I got these from university bought them. I picked them out. The university pays a bill. That's kind of nice when you can make that work. <laughs> but uh, they didn't know she was pregnant either. Chances are that they'd have kept her back and not uh, not had her out. They didn't know she was pregnant. So let's face it: in agriculture, things happen. A uh, fence gets down. A gate gets left open. Cattle get together, and sometimes you don't know. So anyway, so that's why she was now. Um, what age is common for an American Wagyu to finish at? <laughs> so, um, so Wagyu cattle, which is a Japanese breed that has been genetically selected to have lots of marbling, those cattle typically go to market at an older age. They will, on average, I would suggest they would be on the order of uh, over two years of age. And, and in Japan, actually, the, the average age at harvest in Japan is 30 months. So they are a solid two and a half years of age in Japan. And the cattle are fed to a very heavy weight. Uh, it's not uncommon that the steers and, and heifers that are fed to uh, for the production of Japanese beef or, the, or the, the type of beef called Kobe beef, those will get fed, they'll weigh a ton and they'll have, uh, they'll have lots of marbling, but they'll also be appreciably older. They'll be a solid two and a half years of age. So they grow a little slower and they will, uh, they'll feed them a little heavier. So um, yeah, so there's a question, if these were grass fed, how would they be different? All right, so if these were grass fed cattle, they would, uh, chances are, so, when people are doing grass feeding and doing a grass fed program, the cattle on average do not grow as fast because the average grass fed diet is not as enriched in terms of protein or energy. So those cattle do not grow as fast as cattle that are grain fed. So if they were the same age, the carcasses, the live animals would have been lighter. So it takes longer to get a grass fed animal up to these same weights probably well over two years of age. They'd probably not pass two and a half, I'm not saying that, but they would be, they would be older. Another thing that you would find in grass-fed beef is typically they don't have as much fat on the outside of the carcass. And it's not uncommon that the fat that the carcass does have on it will have more of a yellowish or a, bronze, a bronzish uh, tone or color. And that's because of the uh, the beta carotene in the in the grass when they're consuming forages, uh, elements of that get deposited in the fat, and it has a yellow color. And so, depending on the intensity of of grass feeding, and as well as some of the varieties of grass and breed inf uh, breed influences it as well, 
um, they can uh, they can be they can be grass they can uh, have a yellowish color and it will vary in intensity. Okay, I think what we'll do is I'll answer Isaac's question. I'm not sure. I mean, if if um, this session is really going to be just beef evaluation tonight, we did do one on pork as well as lamb. So um, the, I'll show you where those are at the end. And then Angela, if you have a question, I know you're raising your hand a few times here. Go ahead and put <clears throat> it in the Q&A and we can kind of help you out. Connor, Connor has a question on there. How old was oh, she? Yeah, she? She was about 20 months of age. Uh, this heifer was about 20 months of age. So she got she got bred fairly early uh, in her lifespan. She was a uh, kind of a late summer uh, late summer calf at that uh, at that farm. Yeah, so that these are all great questions. Keep them coming. We're going to move back just to kind of quickly go over um, the uh, the steer carcass yep. because we want to make sure we get to the fabrication. So here's the second carcass, the steer carcass with the green ear tag. We saw him quite often, and and Ron was illustrating. He was the big calf, um, mm -hmm. and and I'm going I can go right in close to kind of show you the. Um, since we kind of talked about pieces and parts already on the carcass, we're going to go right back in on his um, ribeye and right. consequent rib uh, back fat. So right, and so him. on and on him, he had uh, he had about he had six tenths of fat, so he was not very far behind the heifer as far as fat. He had about a quarter of an inch less than she did, so he's a little trimmer. Admittedly, when I picked him out live, I thought he'd have a little less fat even than he has, but. What worked against my assessment on that was the fact that he weighed 1,440 pounds or something like mm -hmm. that. It was somewhere in that range. So he was a bigger calf and those bigger cattle will carry a little bit more condition because let's face it, they've probably got a little more age and they've had a little more time on feed if they're in a, in a, uh, in a, in a traditional grain feeding program. So again, as far as back fat, he had about, do we have our I cursor on make it? Make sure we get our- Yeah, mouse. we'll make sure that we've got, uh, that we're pointing <laughs> at it, working. that uh, he's got about six tenths of an inch of fat or so. The ribeye was a couple inches bigger. It was a 14.9. And in the calculation of yield grades for his weight, that was about what he required. And so he didn't have an adjustment to his yield grade on the basis of muscling. It was just kind of left status quo. And so he stayed right in there in the middle, what we call a yield grade three, which is kind of the industry average. Those are most cattle that are harvested in the United States that are going through most of our harvest facilities have a yield grade, a low, kind of a low to middle yield grade three, or they might be in what we call an upper yield grade two. Now, Bernie, back up just a little bit. You were right there. Show those thoracic buttons, if you would, please. There's his brisket. It's trimmer than the heifer. Okay, so look right there. So we're going to, I'm going to, hopefully the cursor's working. If you look at these little white tips on the top of these, what we call thoracic uh, uh, vertebrae, uh, these are the thoracic vertebrae, and these are well, called dorsal processes, but that you don't need to know that. These little white tips out here, we look for these in our assessment of cattle to make to verify that those cattle are young. As the animal gets older, they will those buttons will slowly turn into bone. So Bernie's going to draw draw a circle around that uh, that what we call a button that cartilage tip. She's going to draw another one around one down here, and she'll draw another one. So when we when we evaluate cattle for the assessment of quality. And I said earlier, they have to be young. Well, those, those you know, kind of pearly white uh, cartilage tips on those are illustrations that the animal was young. And so just because you're kind of curious about the age, this steer had been a, I think about a July born steer, according, I, I contacted the producers back to ask them and they thought he was about a July, a July birth. So he was a little bit young, he was a little bit older than the heifer, but he also outweighed her by over 200 pounds. So that that kind of makes sense. So moving on with him, um, again, you can you you've seen the brisket there. Doesn't have as much of fat on there. Uh, going way up high, we see the uh, we saw the cod fat on him. Now in terms of quality grade, he didn't have. And again, it's kind of rough on him because he's uh, you know that's the that's the quality grading card for what we call. Uh, low choice. Right? It looks like the mid choice one, isn't it? It's a small. It is. It's a small the zero. 50? Maybe it is the 50. I think it's yeah, the 50. Is the 50. That's the mid range of the low choice grade there. And that's uh, and that's really, you know, he was kind of close to that or maybe had a little bit less than that. So he wound up getting a low choice grade 
assigned to him. And his final yield grade was again a, a middle a middle yield grade three. It calculated to a yield grade three point four. So he was a more than a little bit of a he was more than a half a yield grade better in terms of cutability or the potential to yield retail product, but he had a little bit less quality than the heifer. So there's a little bit of a balance go in there going on in there as far as which one was the more desirable carcass. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move forward now. Let's what else? What nope. else, Bernie? On that? No, nope. I think that was it. You know, just I think that what's neat to know and understand about live versus you know carcass evaluation is the ability to uh, see what you you know if mm. if you saw what you saw is true when you see him in the, as a carcass, and I think that's always yeah. the unique and fun way that we've been doing this for a long time. Him much longer for, than me. But. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, much longer, <laughs> much longer. But but oh. you know, uh, it's it's just it's fun to see if they read the book, like Ron mm. always says, or or if they really just like were out there and didn't read the book, or they were random, or or what have you. And they surprise you, and you kind of always keep those surprises in the back of your mind. And anybody, as you and anybody that tells you that, oh, they always know this one's going to grade and that one's not, and they are always going to get it 100%. Sorry, they're wrong. Because any of us that have done this, we have got surprises. We've been fooled by some because the cattle don't always read the right. book. They don't. Nor do the thing. pigs, nor do the sheep. Right. Or any of them. We'll get surprises, but that's part of the value of doing that. So now we've got Dylan. Walker, who's the lab manager here with Bernie's capable assistance, he's going to he's going to do a bit of a breakdown on this carcass. So he has dropped what we call the four quarter, the front half of that side. So it's one fourth. It's approximately one fourth of the weight of the carcass. He has dropped that down on the table so that he can separate this four quarter into the what we call the primal cuts. So the first thing he's going to do is he's, I think, I haven't, I haven't previewed this, but the first thing he's going to do is he's going to separate what is called the uh, the chuck. Oh, he's going to pull a temperature on it because oh, they verify yeah. the temperature of the carcass to make sure it's appropriate temperature and they record that for as a part of the food safety program at the uh, in the UW facility here. And then what he's going to do is he's going to make a cut and he's going to separate uh, this area that we're kind of closest to called the called the rib and the plate and he's going to separate that from the from the chuck and the uh, the brisket and the shank so he's making a cut between the fifth and the sixth rib something for you to know is that all of the ways that processors will do their fabrication do their cutting we're trying to do a few things we're trying to separate leaner parts of the carcass from fatter parts we're trying to separate more tender muscles from less tender muscles. Uh, we're trying to cut, uh, so, so muscle kind of has a bit of a, what we'll call a kind of a grain or a fiber orientation. We're trying to cut most of our cuts. We're making cuts that go kind of against the grain so that we shorten that fiber, uh, that fiber length that enhances the eating experience. But so Dylan is making a cut. Uh, he's got a cut between, he was cutting through the, through the sternum you know, there by the brisket, and now he's cutting through the through the vertebrae of the, the part of the back, right, kind of right behind the shoulder, barely behind the shoulder, and he's cutting between the fifth and the sixth rib. I think he needs to get a sharper blade on yeah. his saw, because that took a while, <laughs> and then he's using a big knife that we call a breaking knife to go ahead and make that large cut, and so now that part he's got his left hand on is called the beef rib. The part down closer to the bottom of the screen is what we call the plate, so he'll be making a cut here in a little bit between the between the rib and the plate to separate that out. Um, he's continuing to cut there because down toward the bottom, there's a little bit of the shoulder blade or the scapula that kind of comes in there. And so he's now he's got that completely separated. So again, this is the the beef chuck as well as the brisket, which is again just down there by his right hand. He's yeah, he's looking through there. He can pull some short ribs out of that area if he chooses to. And so he's making a cut. Is that what he's pulling his short ribs out of there? I think. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. and That's so tricky. let's see. We're gonna That's we're gonna scoot on so we don't run out of time on this. But he's making just a basic cut, uh, and you kind of make that cut at where the first rib kind of goes down and joins a brisket. Now he's making a cut to separate the brisket from the shank. And now what you've got in front of you is what's called a square cut chuck. 
And so he's showing the parts of the parts of the muscles that come into play there. I'm trying to see what he's pointing at. He's got part of the ribeye muscle. This is what we call the arm face. That other face was called the blade face of the square cut chuck. And so this is a part that was going right back to the rib. As you look at that, and we've got the blade bone right there. Now he's going to okay. move it to the other table. Oh, so one right. thing to maybe note in the chuck, there's lots of different, um, you know, cuts that were that were found, muscles mm -hmm. that were found in the chuck to be of high value. And that's where the pork, uh, the pork, the beef group. The NCBA put a lot of research money into finding those, so finding more value in the chuck. And so flat iron steak might be something you're familiar with, the top blade, blade um, uh, steak, you know, all those pieces and parts that have come from the chuck have added value. We didn't go through and dissect the chuck in that way. There are a number of videos online that, do, that does that, that I will share with you. So if you're really interested in that, that's something you can kind of do. But um, as we think about pieces and parts of the carcass, the chuck is one that does a lot of locomotion, right? Mm -hmm. It does a lot of work. And so when you're thinking about cutting ro or cooking roasts or steaks or what have you from the chuck, you're probably going to want to use a little moisture, might want to use slower, the, take yeah. a little time, let, yeah. let, uh, let time be to your advantage. So what we do in those naturally more tough cuts or less tender cuts, a better way to say it, we'll, you, we'll use time and moisture and heat to kind of solubilize or soften the yeah. connective tissue that makes those cuts makes those cuts hard. Now what so Dylan's doing there is quickly the, pulling out the, what we call the, the bony part of the brisket. Um, it's just part of the sternum that it, that gets pulled out of there. And there's a bit of fat underneath there that the industry actually calls the decal. And so they'll, he'll trim that up and he's just getting that trimmed up to where that's ready to, uh, to be cured and turned into to corned beef for uh, St. Patty's Day. day. Bertie's a big, uh, big Irish Best fan time. here. She's, uh, she's uh, gets all excited when she sees a brisket that she can turn in and uh, and he turn into corn he beef. He won't eat my brent mint brownies. No, I don't. To celebrate. Uh, no, that's Anyways. just wrong. Don't do that to a self respecting so now, brownie. Now, what did what did so? Did what he just off? cut off here is what it's part of the diaphragm of the animal, and uh, what uh, what it's called as a retail cut is we peel the connective tissue off of the. It's got a film of connective tissue on both sides of it. We peel that off, and what's left of that we call the beef skirt. And a beef skirt or a skirt steak, or you can make it into steaks, but people use those for things like fajitas and other products like that. So now he's he's kind of drawing a line across that rib where he's going to separate the uh, the plate from the primal rib. So out of the rib, we'll get our really nice ribeye steaks or a prime rib roast or whatever we want on that. But he's just cutting across the bone, cutting across the rib bones here, and the part the the big wide part there is what we call the plate, and we'll get a lot of trim out of that that we'll use to turn into ground beef, but we can also get what are called short ribs out of that that can be used for braising. They'll tend to have a little more fat on them, but those can be used for braising. They're, they're ri ridiculously delicious when they're prepared well, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah, we got the plate and we got the rib. So that's, uh, again, the primal rib we're looking at, and that's the one off the heifer. We can tell because we see all that yeah, fat, all the fat on her. And I don't know, what's he going to do? He's going to cut up the gonna short some, ribs. He's going to cut some short ribs these. to show us. All right. Yep. So he's going to divide this in two, so it's a little easier to work with. And moving forward, all right, he's going to use a saw and just go ahead and cut across those. Yep. Probably didn't want to get the saw dirty and have to clean right. it. We didn't do the band saw. Okay, <laughs> that's all yeah. right. So that they just he just showed you a finished yeah. um, short short um, short ribs. You yeah. Cut the cut so now the, what saw them again what you usually do the on those is we'll, we'll cut between the ribs and divide those into parts. In fact, what a lot of folks would do is cut that length kind of between his hands. They'd cut that in half as well and have those short ribs only like about you know three inches long or something like that. And also kind of get some, some of the ones that have a lot of fat, kind of take those out, trim the lean out of those and use that for uh, something like um, um, stew meat or something like that, or just simply put it into beef trim to be ground up into ground beef or and to go to use for that. But that's a, a short rib section that can be used for that. So now we're on the hind quarter. 
So the first thing he's doing is he's pulling the beef flank. And so he peels that down on the outside. And actually right there, he is pulling the flank steak out um, first and foremost. That's that part he's pulling out there. He's going to cut around there and he can kind of get that to peel out. And so what we'll do a lot of times, we'll also peel. Again, it's got a bit of a membrane or a connective tissue part to it that we'll, uh, we'll peel that off as well. And that's, we'll get the flank steak. And so you see he's run his hand right over that. That's that muscle called the flank steak, flank steak uh, that we'll pull out. Those have a lot of value to them. And so he's getting some of this other pulled off. It'll, he'll take some trim off. It's mostly fat there. Now he's cutting what's left of what's called the hanging tender. It's another part of the diaphragm. And now he's working on pulling out what we call kidney fat. So there's, there's fat that lies around the kidneys on the inside of the animal. They kind of have a protective role for the, for the organs on the inside of the animal, as well as the fact that they are a, a place for storage of energy. When the animal's fed, uh, you know, and often again, on a grain-based diet, they'll have an excess of energy that winds up getting deposited as fat in the animal. So he's pulling out that that kidney to. fat now. Licky here. He's gonna so, pull, he's oh, gonna, is he going to pull that out? Pull it out? So what he's got right there above his hand is what we call the beef tenderloin. And that tenderloin is, as it's named, very, very tender. That muscle doesn't have to work all that hard in the live animal. So it's tender. And also because during, after the animal's been harvested, it's subjected to a little bit of stretch. So it tends to be really, really tender. And it's also really quite lean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's pulling out, he's pulling out another version of the skirt steak now um, as well. And um, so he's going to get that out. And again, it's a matter of capturing value from whatever you can capture value from. So that's another, uh, that's another skirt steak that's uh, that's harvested out of there. Um, it's actually the transverse abdominis muscle for those who mm -hmm. want to know. There you go. Which probably includes only about one person, and that's me. Surprise but, your biology uh, teacher. Yeah, tomorrow. that's Maybe right. Time. You can tell them. <laughs> you this can is... tell them. Pulling some more. Yeah, pulling more of that, pulling more of the abdominal muscles out of here, and a lot of that will go to trim. Uh, that we get ground up and utilized for ground beef and the like. So now one of the unique things about the hind quarters, you still got one rib down there because again, cattle have 13 ribs and it made that cut between the, between the fore quarter and the hind quarter between the 12th and 13th. So that's that part above his elbow there, below his elbow there is he's still got the 13th rib to deal around. So right now he's making a cut, kind of working around the vertebrae to remove this, this tenderloin muscle um, that you'll hear called also, you'll hear it referred to as filet mignon when it appears on restaurant menus. And he just tries to really carefully cut along that so he can take that out and not make too many cuts in it and not score it or not do any damage to it because that's a very high value muscle. One of the most expensive cuts that you can get out of a beef carcass. And it's only got two. It's got one on each side. And uh, so there's the whole the whole beef tenderloin and so before it gets ready it's going to get trimmed up and get that fat off of it and again it's going to get some membrane so now he's making a cut that's going to remove what we call the short loin from the sirloin area and you do that by cutting across what's called the last of the lumbar vertebrae and that just kind of allows you to cut that short loin portion off and so now let's see, what's he going to do next? He's going to cut that remaining, that trailing talk, rib. want to talk the, about the end. There. Oh, sure. And down on this end that we're looking at, what we see there, for those of you that do meats, uh, meats judging, you, you run into porterhouse steaks and you have to differentiate those from, from, uh, uh, from uh, T-bone steaks. Well, you're looking at a porterhouse steak there, except that the porterhouse steak would still include a cross section of the tenderloin would still be on there. And Bertie just nicely drew those pictures to illustrate that. And one of the things that proves it's a porterhouse got that other muscle that kind of comes in on the top of it there. That's a muscle that we usually talk about being associated with the back leg. It's called the gluteus medius muscle. So again, probably information you didn't want to have or didn't necessarily need, but that muscle proves that we've moved back farther toward the rear leg of the animal uh, just because different muscles in different places on the animal, okay? So he's going to cut that 13th rib off of there. I think we're going to move, we're going to move along. 
And by the way, one of the things we do in, in meat cutting and the like is we try to use the saws to cut bone. And we got done cutting through the bone. Now he's laying that tenderloin back on there to illustrate again where that came from. He's pointing at the muscle and it would have had the tenderloin if it was cut on the saw into porterhouses. We try to use the saw to cut, cut bone. And then we, when we're done cutting, cutting through bone and the like, then we go to a knife to cut muscle and fat. And that's just the way it works a little bit better. So now he's separating the sirloin, which is that part underneath his left arm, from the beef round. Okay, that's the full beef round. Yes. That's some my... <laughs> We're hearing noises in the in the lab. <laughs> so this is a make this is again a cut of what's called the sirloin from the round. And you do that by going a little ways in front of what's called the pelvic bone, or we call it the H bone. Uh, so that's your full sirloin. And so out of that, you can, you can take the bone out of that and you can make what are called top sirloin steaks. And you can make, uh, well, you can make bottom sirloin steaks. You can make, you can even pull uh, a muscle off of that and make what are called culotte, uh, culotte steaks from that as well. So that's, yeah. again, that's, that, that's that, that product we were talking about that would go into making a... Uh, going to make an, a, a, a porterhouse steak. And there's part of the verte vertebrae body or the vertebral body on there. And you know, uh, it's kind of towards the back when you start seeing the bone become kind of a wedge or a mm -hmm. flatter bone. So, you know, you're in the, in, generally in the sirloin. Bite. I'll also tell you, they had a little bit of a challenge on this carcass during the harvest process. They didn't cut it cut exactly in half because there's, this is the this is the center of the carcass. So this actually should have been on the other side. This little product there, they had a problem with the saw during the harvest process. So this is the exact center right through here, between because that's actually the spinal cord, mm -hmm. part of the spinal column right there. So we'll move. We'll keep that. moving along. And uh, so we're back now, getting back towards the back. So we're, we're from the opposite end of the chuck. So all the middle meats we talked about. The, the rib, the loin, the sirloin. And so those are generally grilled. You know, we always say dry, moist or dry, moist. And most of those middle meats are all and don't overcook dry, them. right? The worst thing you can do with them is overcook them because the longer you cook them, the tougher they get. Right. And so those middle meats that are naturally tender, you don't want to overcook those. You want to be very nice to them. Just mm -hmm. cook them gently and then enjoy. So and now he's taking the, he's cutting out the, this little bit of product on the front side of that, what's called an H bone. And actually this, this, what he's pulling out of there, when it gets, comes out right, that gets marketed as a little, they call it like a spider muscle or something like that. Now that wasn't even heard of years ago, but I actually think a lot of that came in a little bit more through the Hispanic culture that they would salvage. They would harvest that product out of there. And when you trim that fat off of it, it's got, it kind of looks like it's got a little bit of a webbing that comes out that's a little connective tissue strands that extend off of the center of it. And so it takes on that appearance. And so this is the round. And so, you know, what Ron is kind of talking about, again, is just finding different values, added values to muscles because they maybe don't do much. So that muscle really just sits there in the, that H, right in front of that H bone. And so it's probably a bit more tender than probably the rest of the muscles mm -hmm. in the round. And so again, it's at the other end. So it does a lot of action and locomotion. So there's quite a bit of connective tissue and heavy bands of um, uh, that sort of thing going on. So you're gonna have to be creative with your cooking. Mm -hmm. You're gonna need an Instapot or a crock pot or a Dutch oven with some, some broth or some other type of fun spices that um, you kind of get into and then cook it low and slow. Yeah, but Set boy, it. when you fix them good, when you fix oh, them well, they amazing. are incredible. They yep. can they can deliver an incredibly good eating experience. Yep. So what Dylan's doing now is he's pulling out what's the, the remaining part of the pelvic bone here. It's called the H bone. He's got to make a cut uh, between that where it's got a connective tissue, a tendinous attachment to the uh, to the head of the femur. Uh, the femur, just to let you think about it, the femur on the animal, that's the, the ball, the femur, the whatever. You can kind of see that shiny round thing right there at the on the uh, the right side of your screen. We're looking right down at really shiny and all. That's the head of the femur bone. Now, your femur is in your upper leg, okay, above your knee, that big bone that's between your knee and your hip, that's your femur. Well, that's the head of the femur where it inserted into the pelvic bone on, uh, on, a, on a bovine, on a steer. Okay, and he's just trimming the fat 
on the outside of the round here. Now, uh, there's a big muscle right there on the top that is literally called the top round muscle. That can be used to make some nice, uh, nice roasts. Can be cut into steaks. Uh, round steaks tend to be a little temperamental and hard to work with and to keep in good quality. But you know, you can do nice round roasts. Use them for the development of roast beef. Um, other products like that. He's making a cut. What he's trying to do is, is find the seams and cut between the seams between the different muscles. And so when you do that, when you kind of what we what we call muscle bone a carcass then you can really kind of put those different muscles to their best use. Bernie talked earlier about the, the uh, NCBA had sponsored this uh, meat quality audit work to try to find best use and find ways to capture more value and use for different muscles. That was part of what was done through that, is finding a way to separate those different muscles and really do a lot of research to see uh, how to get more value out of some of them. So right now he's cutting around the femur so that he can he can take out the uh, the top round or the it's called the inside round. It's called the top round. Uh, you can kind of call it what you want. He's trying to trim right around the femur. The femur bone itself will be kept out a lot of the time and uh, and used as what's called a marrow bone or uh, used in other ways to again capture value. Because one of the things that we kind of owe these animals that we're choosing to use to provide products for, for us is to make as full and complete and responsible use of them as we possibly can. And so that femur, fever, fever bone, good grief. Mm -hmm. That femur bone will be, will be used out of this. Um, a lot of the vertebrae and the like, different chefs and the like, we use those to make beef, uh, beef stock. Uh, beef stock and beef broth. Uh, when you when you kind of cook those in water, they'll yield a lot of gelatin, and uh, that can make a really good broth as well. So he just pulled the femur out. Now down below here, we've got what's called a lower shank, and uh, so that's that part that he just pulled off. And so he thought uh, that's the kneecap right there that he's taken out, or what we'd call the kneecap. I don't know if we really call it a kneecap in cattle. We just tend to call it the patella. Okay, so now he's going to continue and separate the uh, top round or the uh, also known as the inside round. He's working through a natural seam in there by pulling on the product and just getting that seam to open up and using the tip of his knife to just kind of let that uh, reveal itself with a little bit of pull and a little bit of pressure. And, uh, you know, sometimes people use like <laughs> stew meat or get stew meat maybe out of yeah. round and use that to make, you know, different types of products, um, you know beef so beef for stew or make it into stir fry thinly you know mm -hmm. sliced uh product out of the round because you know you're going to add pr uh flavor and also uh some sort of moisture so now he's what pulling is, out yeah he's eye. pulling out what we call the eye of round there and again trim that up and it's it very often gets cut into like you know half inch thick you know little eye of round steaks they'll be mm -hmm. kind of tough you got to be careful the way you use them then the other products, now stop it right there, Bernie. So right in front of him, he just put his hand on. That Oops. was the, whoop, we just skipped forward. Oh, um, that part he had his hand on, that was, uh, I'm trying to remember what order they were in. Okay, so there's the eye of round he's pulling out, the semitendinosus muscle. And now what he's got is the, uh, the part closest to him is what's called the bottom round. And the part that's closer to us, a little farther away that he separated off is what's called the, uh, uh, the sirloin tip or the uh, or the or the quadriceps group the quadriceps muscle group mm -hmm. and uh, so it it as the name implies made up of four muscles so yep. Bernie we're at 754 yeah. do we see if we have yeah, any questions or through, let's stop the share and look through some questions right. um let's see let's maybe go down um how are the we talked about the age um how uh, okay the, okay so the calculations percent. the calculations the cal there are some calculations out there that are you can find them on a USDA site or, or mm -hmm. you know you can contact one of us and we can send you a calculation. But it's literally the, a higher yielding animal. It has more retail product is going to be one that has more muscle and less fat. And it's as simple as that. Uh, the amount of bone remarkably doesn't really vary as much as you might expect. But uh, that's one of the things that it just it just amounts to. So if they're really trim and they've got some muscle, they'll be high yielding as far as retail product. If they're really fat and light muscle, 
then they're going to not yield as much. And mm -hmm. animals certainly vary in their muscularity, just like people do. Uh, they vary in muscularity. The difference is cattle don't really work out and build muscles. Mm -hmm. If you like going to the gym, they don't really do that very much. Yep. Uh, what else did we there have? There was a few questions about dressing percent, and I just wanted to show this slide yeah. um, on dressing percent. So we, I put together what we we have a poster. We have an old poster, mm -hmm. and and the cattle finished weight was twelve hundred pounds. Well, that's we're we're not in those days anymore. We're we're at heavier weights, and so I created this. Um, we did the poster in this way and just talked about what percent of that animal's carcass is coming from these primals. And um, right now, you know, 63% of this animal would yield uh, of 63% of a 1400 pound steer, which I think is what we figured the heifer had it for addressing, no, the steer, the steer had, had about 63%. Yeah. So it would yield an 880 pound carcass. And so that's, you know, where we kind of figure out what's the required ribeye size for an 880 pound carcass. And in relation to the rest of its, um, you know, product on the carcass is mostly in muscle, not in fat. So we kind of talk about when we talk about dressing percent, um, it's it's largely that, and there's lots of factors that go into dressing percent. We could be here all hour talking about It'd dressing percent, time. Yeah. but we also talk about how, you know, all the factors in carcass evaluation is really around um, quality grade is really how good the carcass is. And then yield grade, which is kind of what this, this slide shows is how much you get yeah. from the animal. And if you kind of keep them in those two separate categories, it kind of keeps beef evaluation pretty simple. Yeah. How much of it and how good is it is really kind of the best way to clarify it. And, and we're kind of guilty. We'd kind of mm -hmm. like to have our cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. We like to have yield. Mm -hmm. But if you've got yield without quality, then you've got a lot of stuff that you may not have an enjoyable experience from. Right. If you've got a lot of quality, which you can have, but not much yield, then I heard, sure hope you enjoy your eating experience because it's not going to last very long because, again, there's not as much product. So there's always that balance in there. And that's what we talk about all the time right. in animal evaluation. We're looking for those animals that really deliver on, on both those fronts. Mm -hmm. They've got They've got potential for quality and they've got potential for yield. So and, Bernie's yeah. putting up a note here. Yeah. You can talk about this. Well, if it, you want we, to. we kind of talked about this at great length a, a weekend ago with our carcass judges that judge carcass shows at the county fair. So some of you may have been exposed to a county judge, a county fair judge that judged uh, the carcasses in a cooler, or you may have had an ultrasound judge that have, might have done the same thing. And we kind of talk about um, we, we really rank those animals or those carcasses based on what the industry considers valued carcasses or ideal carcasses. And that is reflected by what they can sell the product for and where it fits into the, uh, into the consumer base in the U.S. Right. So I'm going to just draw here um, the, the, kind of the, the scope that we kind of look at is the 600. Oof, I'm a terrible drawer here. Wow. Bad. <laughs> And the six to nine hundred pound carcasses is kind of where we're at, and and uh, I must I should have picked a different uh, annotate. But you know we've got prime carcasses that you can see get the most money, um, and and so we kind of have to pay attention to prime carcasses because those are pretty pretty awesome. Um, we look at the certified, uh, which is really like choice plus and choice average yield grades one to three are really that second level of high value. Well, actually third level of high value, because now we talk about prime yield grade four being as valuable as something that is a yield grade one and three. Oh, yeah. And we've never talked about yield <laughs> grades uh, fours being of a high value unless now, in this case, because quality drives market, the train. The market is rewarding quality. It yep. really is. Yep. So the higher quality grade you are, and you can be in a yield grade one to three, you will do very well in a carcass show. Mm -hmm. um, if you're low choice in really, and you're any yield grade, you're really just not a very valued, valued carcass. And we used to say, if you could grade low choice, you're in the money. Well, not really anymore. Not I, if not anybody anymore. else shows up. <laughs> One thing to add on this, though, is that the frequency of cattle that grade prime that have that that you know higher level of marvin that has gone up over the last number of years, and it's mm -hmm. gone up over the last number of years because 
One, producers have been genetically selecting for mm -hmm. cattle that have more genetic potential to deposit marble. I mean, there, are, there are prediction uh, parameters out there called EPDs or expected progeny differences. And to get those from collecting, you know, collecting data on animals, progeny of different bulls and the like, they can also get data on animals that are still alive by doing ultrasound and kind of getting an idea of how much marbling. Okay. So that's that's the reason. And then also genetically, uh, we're getting more cattle that have been selected uh, genetically kind of predestined to hopefully have some more marbling. But also, again, the fact that we're feeding cattle to heavier weights, they're a little bit older when mm -hmm. they get there. And they've had a little more time to deposit that marble. Mm -hmm. So that plays a role as well. There's a couple of questions in here um, just around logistics. Before we end, I'll, we'll go over to where the YouTube channels are. There's in all that stuff. I'll show you that here in a second. Um, I'll wrap up kind of some of those. I think there's just one question here that I'll have Ron answer. Does cow meat get less tender as the cow gets older? Uh, Do you want to talk about that? That would be a big uh, yes, it does. Because as animals get older, they get more what we call connective tissue. The amount of connective tissue they have goes up. But in addition to that, the connective tissue they've got gets tougher. It gets more what we call cross-linked. And so the more they have, as well as the, the condition of that connective tissue, both of those things are compromised the older the animal gets. So yeah, they are. Yep. So I'm going to show it. That's a great question. And we're going to, I'll show you and put in the, the chat here, some of the rounding um, things here we have for this evening. So I'm going to put in the chat, the, um, the, maybe not just hang on a second. Uh, you guys are going to be looking for um, the, let's see, I want to show you two things. There are, um, two things I need for you to um, do tonight. One is to uh, fill out a evaluation and that's gonna be um, in the email or actually in the, when you close out this evening, it'll actually uh, do that for you. So I'm gonna zoom you over here to that uh, survey. Make sure you fill that out for me because that helps us uh, in planning these next kind of sessions for you all and then gives us, um, a heads up really on the next year's uh, sessions. Uh, then the other item I was going to um, show you or get you to is the uh, information related to uh, filling out the educational credits uh, for your um, for those of you who need that um, that information when you are going to your county fair. So here is that sheet. There's It's a fillable uh, PDF that's in the chat for you. Uh, please click on that and fill it out and um, we'll uh, hook you up. So the ending thing here, I'm just going to show you where these um, YouTube channels are at. So I'm going to bounce over here to a few of the things that I want you to know and be aware of when um, you're looking for all things Wisconsin Youth Livestock. So here's the Wisconsin Youth Livestock Program channel on YouTube. Please just go on YouTube and search Wisconsin Youth Livestock Program and you will see all of the videos. And there are a number of years of videos up here for you all. Um, you can see there's, we had in January, the knowledge judging teams. Here is the pork evaluation um, food safety one we did last year. And then there is the lamb one right here, the lamb carcass evaluation. So uh, there's a tour of the meat science building. There's just so much wealth of information here, roaming the rumen through a cannulated cow, really neat stuff to learn from. So take some time and go through them and learn from some of the great resources I pulled together to help me do these types of um, sessions. Here's the Instagram page. If you're an Instagrammer, follow us on WI Youth Livestock LVSTK. And um, if you're a Facebook person, Wisconsin Youth Livestock Program will get you, will get you there. And um, I know many of you are online and, and getting those types of uh, information through those modes of delivery that I choose to um, send it out. The other website I'd like you to be familiar with is really the youth. It's um the youth livestock page, it's youthanimalscience.wisc.edu. And that's another one that you should really kind of have on your 
on your front calendar and go to the calendar and all the new things that are coming up. We have some building tours available uh, here at the end of the month and then in April. Our next session will be, um, let's see, we're gonna scroll down to, or actually, here we go. Um, we're going to have in April, April 3rd is our last session. We're gonna have reproductive technologies in agriculture. So we're gonna see Dr. Nate Doorhorse actually work with AIing uh, a sheep. Uh, so you'll get to learn and there, hopefully we can get the camera to work on the end of the probe to be able to see inside while he's doing that. So that's going to be super fun and educational. I'm excited for that. And uh, that will be April 3rd. So here's the registration link for that to happen. And then there was a lot of questions in the Q&A about um, you know, slides, some information, some resources, and I'll have those all in an email that will go out to you sometime tomorrow. So there'll be resources and links. Um, and, and then probably a week from now, roughly, will be when the recording of the whole session will be transcribed and ready for you to review, okay? So um, those are some just uh, housekeeping things. I'm just gonna quick look through the Q&A before we end this evening. Um, it was really great to have you. You guys were did a great job with the questions and we'll keep these questions um, as we kind of put together the next one. Again, uh, do the survey and then make sure you um, click on this link for the educational verification form. So Ron, good job. Been fun. Yeah. Let's it's, do it again sometime. Yeah, let's, we'll do a round two again, right? There you go. So thanks Ron for being here. Again, you haven't missed a beat in always, your retirement. So. Fun. <laughs> That's great. All right, everybody have a great February, Valentine's Day tomorrow. Take care of that, have I guess. Great, uh, have a great uh, project here. Yeah, have a great evening and look forward to seeing you this summer around the fairs. Take great. care. Bye-bye.